Hi, and welcome to module 6 of lecture 9. In this module, we're going to discuss the concept of stochastic dominance. I'm going to write that down because it's a little uncommon phrase. Stochastic dominance. Now, from the name of it, it kind of gives you a hint of what it's going to be. Stochastic, again, means random, um, probabilistic. And dominance means better, right? It dominates in the sense of, in the sense of utility. Um, one action in game theory dominates another action if it's always better to do. So Catholic dominance is like that. If one distribution stochastically dominates another, it provides a better um, a better scenario, I guess, a better um, lottery for you to play. Um, so in general, there's different kinds of stochastic dominance. Um, the first is known as first order stochastic dominance or FOSD for short, first order stochastic dominance. Now, it has a D, not a P at the end there. <laughs> now, as you can guess from the example I just used for dominance and for better, right? Stochastic dominance is going to be primarily useful to you in the context of game theory, um, and actually in the more advanced game theories. Um, and the goal is to, un is to be able to compare two uncertain scenarios directly rather than having to go through the, comp the um, step of calculating expected utility, we're instead going to say, okay, well, this, this um, uncertain outcome is just better than this other uncertain outcome. We give an easy example of that. Let's take just the lottery example we've been doing so far. Let's say there's one lottery that has a, that has a 99% chance of giving you zero and a 1% chance of giving you $10. All right, not a good lottery. Now let's say another lottery um, that has a 99% chance of giving you $10 and a 1% chance to give you $100. Much better lottery. It doesn't take a lot of math to recognize that the second lottery is much, much better than the first lottery. So we would say that the second lottery stochastically dominates the first lottery. In fact, the second lottery first order stochastically dominates the second lottery. What that means is for anyone who prefers more of something in this case, money, the second lottery is more likely to give you more money than the first lottery. Therefore, for anyone who prefers more of money, in this case, more of something, the second um, lottery is strictly better than the first lottery. You would always choose the second lottery over the first lottery. There's no world, there's no, doesn't matter what you, your preferences are, as long as you want more of something, right? You can be risk averse, risk seeking, whatever. Um, as long as you want more of something, you always choose the second lottery because it's better. It's pretty obvious in this case because every possible outcome is better. That's not always true, but the underlying concept that if one distribution dominates another distribution, you should choose the first distribution is generally true, even when the lottery is not so obviously better. Because of this, it becomes a really useful tool in game theory that you'll use as you go on, particularly in, in topics such as monotone comparative statics. Um, that too, that's an odd term. Monotone comparative statics. You often see comparison of distributions used because monotone comparative statics is a tool used in game theory to allow you to come to conclusions about how equilibria change with parameters. As we'll see at the very end of um, part five of here, this is comparative statics and we'll discuss how you can calculate those um, a little bit at the last, in the last lecture of this course. Um, but for now, all that's important to know is that it allows you to compute how these equilibria of games change with parameter values without having to go through and calculate the equilibria always. So it's a useful tool. You also see, you also see a lot of um, use of stochastic dominance in boundedly rational behaviors. These type of models of bounded rationality are often stochastic, and to get any kind of results out of them, you often have to compare distributions directly and you can compare them using the concept of stochastic dominance. So here's sort of why you would see this ever. And again, these are mostly advanced topics, so you're not going to be seeing this immediately in your stats or game theory classes, but it's there. Um, you can always come back to this, this uh, module later, and it's there for you to get a handle for, of what this actually is, what's going on here in this, in this concept, and how you can compare distributions. Turns out the actual definitions are pretty straightforward compared to the setup here. Um, first order stochastic dominance, can be defined in a couple of ways. 
the first way compared to the CDF. Now we say F dominates G. So I'll write F first order so you can see dominates G. Um, if this relationship holds for the CDFs. Now, this might seem strange immediately because we usually have something dominating being greater. And here we're saying F dominates G, but the CDF of F is less than the CDF of G. To understand this, you have to really understand what a CDF means, what a CDF is. All right, so let's just draw two different CDFs. The blue one up here will be F. Remember, CDFs go from 0 to 1, so this will be 0 over here. And we'll extend this a little bit, and this will be 1 over here. And then and here's the red one's going to be the CDF of G, which might look like this. And that should also intersect there at 1. Um, now, here G is above F, right? So, and just to remind you what each one is, I'll, I'll color it G in as red and F in as blue. Um, now, G is above F, but note what the CDF is telling you is the chance that any num the number drawn, that the value drawn from the distribution is less than or equal to the value of X. So over here, at this point here, right, for the, for the CDF F, this blue one down here, the chance of drawing a number less than or equal to, let's say, x0 down here, is this probability over here. In contrast, and I'll put that blue, in contrast, the probability of drawing a number less than or equal to x0 for g is up here. Therefore, the probability of drawing, of drawing a number less than or equal to any value here is going to be greater for g. That means the probability of drawing a number greater than this value over here is always going to be greater in f than for g. You can see that by adding, by looking at the 1 minus f of x, 1 minus f of x the probability of drawing a number greater than x. And we see that that flips the inequality, looks like that. So what this thing says, this condition says, Effectively, the probability of drawing a number greater than or equal to any um, value is greater for f than for g. That effectively means that higher numbers will pop up more often in the distribution f than in g. And therefore, if you want more of something, f is going to be a dominant distribution compared to g. So, this is one definition of first order stochastic dominance. It's the sort of central definition because it directly compares distributions and tells you that for the distribution F, you're more likely to get higher numbers than in, in the distribution G. And that's the core insight there, that you're more likely to get higher numbers in distribution F than in distribution G. Now, I kept tying this back to wanting more of something. And that's because the second definition, which I'm going to write actually in the same one because it's um, very close related, is that, where did that go? If you um, take the expected value of the distribution um, f, then it's going to be greater than or equal to the distribution for g as long as u is an increasing function. As long as u is an increasing function, then the expected value of the function u over the distribution f is going to be greater than or equal to the same thing over g. In other words, if f dominates g, if f first order dominates g, then for any increasing function u, you get a higher expected utility given f than given g. So going back to the lottery example, the lottery for, for the second one dominates the lottery for the first one because the expected value for the first one is greater than for the second, sorry, for the second one is greater than for the first one. The thing is, whenever that's true for an increasing function, even if the lotteries aren't so obviously better than each other, um, you still can apply this, this, this definition 
So if all we had was a general distribution f, and all we knew was how to compare it to g, we could still tell you which one you should play, which lottery you should play, based solely on the comparison between f and g, that one dominates the other one. So that is first order stochastic dominance. It's true for any increasing function. And the reason, again, goes right back to the definition, because the distribution f produces higher numbers in general, is more likely to produce higher numbers than g in expectation, in, on average, right? then um, anyone who wants more of something prefers the distribution that's more likely to give you higher numbers, and that's f. So that's why it's useful, um, and that's how it's used often in game theory, is to compare utilities over given uncertainty. Now that actually puts a fairly substantial um, requirement on the distributions to satisfy a bunch of properties. We might not want something that strong, so what we can do is define second order of stochastic dominance. And that's going to be SOSD, and this is used much less frequently. It's the exact same definition we just saw, comparing um, distribution expected values over distributions. This would be f dominates g, except here u is a concave function. Where a concave function represents risk-averse preferences. So what this is saying is that f second order dominates g if um, the expected value over f is greater than that over g for all concave functions, u. So if all risk-averse individuals, they prefer the distribution f to the distribution g. Um, note that if it first order dominates, it also second order dominates, because if it's true for any increasing function, it's also true for an increasing concave function. I should say this is also for increasing concave functions. Here. What does this look like? Well, let's say I have two distributions. Um, one looks like that, and then the blue one looks like that. And let's say it's the exact same mean down here. So if you were completely risk neutral, the expected value of this lottery, well, regardless of your risk preferences, the expected va value of these two distributions is the same, the mean is the same. So if you're risk neutral, you should not care about which lottery you play. Therefore, neither one is going to dom is going to first order dominate the other one because a risk neutral person should not care about which one they play. However, if you're risk averse, you strictly prefer the lottery in blue. And the reason is there's less chance of getting a low number. Remember, risk averse people have a concave function it looks like this, so they're less invested in getting gains than they are. In, and they are worried about getting, taking losses. So, um, because this white distribution, this more spread out distribution, has more of a chance of both getting higher gains, but also of getting um, higher losses, a risk averse person would prefer the blue distribution, which has a lower chance of getting higher gains, but also a lower chance of getting higher losses. And since the losses are more important relative to the gains for the risk averse person, the risk averse person prefers the narrower lottery. So we'd say that the blue distribution, second order stochastically dominates the white distribution. Right? The, the, the less spread out one, second order stochastically dominates the more spread out one. We say in this case that the white one um, is a mean preserving spread of the, of the blue one. So if you take, keep the means the same and just spread out the distribution, then you have a mean preserving spread a mean preserving spread keeps a risk neutral person indifferent between the two, but makes a risk averse person prefer the one that's more narrowly distributed, that has less variance. And so this is useful when you're trying to compare utilities for risk averse people, primarily. And you can do, the, there's an easier example in the book, in which you have, say, comparing a uniform distribution from zero to five versus one from one to, uh, what is it? two to four, one to five, sorry. One to five and two to four, they each have a mean of three, but the second distribution is narrower, has less chance of getting lower numbers, 
I can't get a one, I can't get a five. Um, and therefore, the person prefer, uh, an up risk averse person prefers the second to the first. Again, the goal, the point of all this is that you can compare distributions directly without having to go through and compute expected utilities. And that's it for this topic. Again, this is a more advanced topic. Um, you know, you, you, it's useful for understanding a lot of conceptual stuff in probability, but you probably won't see it into more advanced classes. But still, it's here, um, so you can always go back to it. Right. Thank you very much.